All right, so now that we have kind of talked about what evolution is and a little bit about what it might look like, we're going to start moving into how this actually occurs within a population. So it's always important to remember, and I'm going to keep reminding you of this, evolution occurs at the population level, not the individual level. No individuals are evolving. They either survive and reproduce or they die. However, the population as a whole over generations will change and thus evolve. Okay? So this is just a little summary of what you have to know from chapter 23. So what you have to know about evolution in populations and Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So you have to know how mutation and sexual reproduction produce genetic variation. Luckily, we've basically already covered that. We're going to review it a little bit, but mutation is just changes in DNA. So if you change your DNA, you're going to change the proteins you code for, or I should say you might change the proteins you code for. You need to know how sexual reproduction produces genetic variation. So go back to meiosis and think about all the different gametes you could produce. Right? We need to know the conditions for Hardy-Weinberg equal, equilibrium, excuse me, and then of course how to use the Hardy-Weinberg equation in order to figure out whether a population is actually evolving, because that's kind of what Hardy-Weinberg really is. Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is like this ideal situation in which a population is not at all evolving, and so we're going to figure out whether populations are at that equilibrium, and if they are not, then that means that they are evolving. And we're going to explore that. So don't worry too much if that didn't quite make sense yet. So as we move forward, I need you to start using this terminology of microevolution as opposed to macroevolution. So microevolution is changes in the allele frequencies of a population over generations. So it's like all the little changes within a population over time. So maybe like it's some of it's going to be due to random chance. Some of it might be due to some environmental effect, right? But it's just little changes. So we're not forming like new species here. We're just doing like little changes for now, okay? If we do a bunch of microevolution, we get a bunch of little changes. Maybe that will lead to larger scale changes such as a new species, but we're not at that point yet. Okay. So Darwin, if we go back to Darwin and natural selection, he didn't know how organisms pass the traits to their offspring because it wasn't until Mendel in 1866 published his paper on genetics that we even really knew that genetics was a thing. Right. So Darwin just noticed trends in the data, but he didn't have any idea how traits were passed down. Everybody knew that traits were passed down. Like you can see familial resemblances. Everybody knew that, but we didn't know how. We didn't have a mechanism. Okay. And so after Mendel came along and talked about the gene, and he talked about, you know, or not so much the gene, but how traits are held on chromosomes and how those get passed down, etc. Um, that really just went to further cement Darwin's ideas. It further supported the idea of evolution by natural selection because it hinged on genetic variation and genetic variation was there because of what Mendel discovered, right? We knew more about genetic variation because of the ideas of the chromosome. Okay? So just to recap some of the sources of genetic variation that there are, there are point mutations. So that's when a single base changes in your DNA. Okay, so just a single letter, a single A, a single T, a single C, or a single G changes to a different one of those letters. If just a single one of those happens, it's called a point mutation because it's just a single point that changed or mutated. Okay, and that can have huge effects or it can have no effect. Okay, so in the case of sickle cell, that has a gigantic effect on the shape of your red blood cells and on the ability of your blood to carry oxygen as well as a few other things that we're going to get into but just a single change can either mean nothing or it can mean everything okay we also have chromosomal mutations so sometimes chromosomes will get rearranged right you, we have seen that um, a little bit in meiosis but sometimes they get like lumped together sometimes chromosomes get kind of chopped up a little bit all of these things are usually really bad for the organism but basically you just need to remember that meiosis not only can meiosis lead to different gametes but it can also cause a lot of problems if things go wrong 
Okay. And then of course we have sexual recombination. So we have crossing over, we have different gametes that are made. We have half mom, half dad going into a unique child that is unique from both parents. And so you don't need to, um, you know, memorize every little step of that because we've already done that. We've seen crossing over occur in meiosis. We've seen independent assortment. So that's where they line up in different areas during meiosis. And we have seen that different sperm can fertilize different eggs because meiosis makes different sperm cells and different egg cells. So none of this is new. We're just thinking about genetic variation as a whole. Okay. All right. So now that we're talking about the population level, we've been talking about individuals for so long with genetics. Now we need to start zooming out and looking at a whole population and their genetics. And so this term population genetics is really just how populations change genetically. And so remember that a population is a group of individuals in the same area that interbreed and have fertile offspring. So basically just individuals of the same species living in the same area. So they have like some kind of shared resources, right? So when you have a population, we start to have vocabulary to talk about the genetics of the population as opposed to the genetics of the individuals. So the gene pool for a population is basically the combination, just picture like a giant pool of alleles for all members of that population. So it's basically just if we could take the DNA out of every single individual and put it into one place so that we could kind of analyze it all together, that's what the gene pool would be. And that's why the pool term kind of allows us to picture that. And that's why I don't think it's too hard to remember what it is. Okay, so this is just a friendly reminder that if you are a diploid species, and most of the organisms we look at in class are diploid, you are going to have two alleles for every gene right? Because you have two copies of every chromosome and every chromosome has the gene, right? There are a few exceptions, um, like X-linked traits, which we talked about. Um, but this is a really good general rule of thumb. And because we have two alleles, we can either be homozygous, meaning we have two copies of the same allele, or it could be heterozygous, meaning that one of our copies is one allele, the other copy is a different allele. Okay. And now we have this term fixed allele. So a fixed allele is basically when every single member of a population, so everyone in that population, has just the same allele for some trait. Okay, so picture there's a lot of diversity in the human population, right? And picture the stuff that we all have in common, right? We all have skin. Okay, so imagine there's just a single gene for skin. Now, obviously, there's not. There's going to be lots of genes for skin. But we all have skin. And so that would be a fixed allele for that gene. We all have, you know, a capital R, capital R in our, on our chromosomes for that skin gene. Okay? Because if we didn't, we wouldn't have skin. Okay? So the more fixed alleles you have in a population, that means the lower the diversity because it means the, the more stuff you have in common. So like, yeah, we all have skin, so we don't have very much diversity in terms of having skin or not, but we, are, we do have different colors of skin. We have different colors of hair. We have other diversity, right? But in terms of having skin or not, we're very low diversity, right? Maybe some traits do cause you to not have skin, right? So that introduces us to Hardy-Weinberg. So this is a theorem, right? So this is a really well-tested, well-established thing but it is limited in scope. But basically the Hardy-Weinberg theorem, it's named that based on the scientists that have uh, described it, is basically stating that the allele and genotype frequencies of a population will remain constant from generation to generation. Okay? So this is like a hypothetical situation. This is like contradicting all of the stuff we saw in evolution. And that's because there's a caveat right? The allele and genotype frequencies will stay the same unless they are acted upon by forces other than Mendelian segregation and recombination of alleles. That sounds really, really complicated, okay? Basically, the allele and genotype frequencies are going to be the same. So basically, we're going to have the same roughly amount of alleles in the gene pool and all amount of genotypes in the individuals of a population 
unless evolution is happening. Okay, so what Hardy-Weinberg really is, is it's a null hypothesis. It's a way for us to say, oh, nothing interesting is happening. The population's not evolving, right? Remember, our null hypothesis is kind of our boring one, our less interesting one. And so in this case, our null hypothesis is saying the population is not evolving. However, if we get data that allows us to reject the null hypothesis, that would tell me that, oh, no, 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 Hardy-Weinberg is wrong. There is, in fact, something interesting happening. There is, in fact, evolution occurring. Okay. So that equilibrium, you're going to see the term Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, is when allele and genotype frequencies are the same. They are remaining the same across generations. Okay. So if we are not at equilibrium, that means that there is some outside force, which is going to be evolution. Okay. So in order for Hardy-Weinberg to work and to actually be the case for a population, there are some conditions that have to be true. You can't have any mutations occurring because if there are any mutations, you're going to change allele frequencies and thus genotype frequencies. Okay. So no mutations in the population. There has to be random mating because if there was some kind of like you know, preference in the mating, then that's going to affect genotype frequencies. Because, like, if one person gets to mate more than his neighbor, and that's because of some trait he has, then that's going to cause us some problems. There can be no natural selection. So no individuals can have differential fitnesses and thus have better uh, survival and reproduction opportunities. There can only be an extremely large population size because that's going to decrease the effect of randomness on our population, right? If In stats, if you have a larger population or sample size, then you're kind of mitigating the effects of random chance. And there can be no gene flow, so no genes moving around between populations, and we'll get to that in a second. If a single one of these conditions is not met, right, if a single one of these things is not happening, then the population can be found to be evolving, okay? All of these things, it's gonna be extremely unlikely for any population to meet all of these criteria. How many large population sizes can you think of where there's no chance of mutation? None, right? So this is more of a hypothetical situation, okay? This is like our gold standard. This is what we're gonna compare our populations to to see if something interesting is happening. Okay. So the Hardy-Weinberg principle basically hinges on the idea of allele frequencies, and we're going to focus on genes that have two alleles, okay? and we're going to dub these alleles P and Q, okay? lowercase p and lowercase q. P is going to be the frequency of the dominant allele, and Q is going to be the frequency of the recessive allele. And in this case, like just for a general statement, those alleles are going to be A's, right? So the capital A is dominant, the lowercase is recessive. Okay. If there are only two alleles in the population, then P plus Q should equal 1. Basically, I'm saying that when we determine frequency, it's really kind of a percentage. So if there were 70% A, capital A's in a population, and there's only the only other option is little a, then there's got to be 30% little a, right? So P plus Q, so 0 0.7 plus 0 0.3, needs to equal 1. Uh, basically, we're just saying that however many capital A's there are, there has to be some amount of little a's that will balance out to reach 100% of the alleles. So if there's only two alleles in a population, that's going to work great. Okay. So now that we have a simplified equation for P plus Q equals 1, we can work backwards from that equation, which is simple algebra 1. If I know P, I can find Q. If I know Q, I can find P. Okay. Again, this is all hypothetical. Hardy-Weinberg is kind of an ideal that we're going to compare. So if I have two alleles, capital A and little a, that means I have three genotypes. None of this is new. This is all the stuff that we talked about when we were doing Mendelian genetics, Punnett squares, and pedigrees, right? None of this is new. But we have three genotypes. We have homozygous dominant, so capital A, capital A. We have heterozygotes, and we have homozygous recessive, so little a, little a. Right, And so if we are at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, our P squared value plus 2 times PQ, 
plus q squared should also equal 1. So this equation should work if we are at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay? And the way that this equation kind of was derived is basically this homozygous dominant it was represented by pq. Okay? Homozygous recessive is represented by q squared. And the heterozygote uh, proportion of the population is represented by 2pq. And the way by which this is derived is very interesting, and we're going to practice a little bit in class. But ultimately, what I care more about is that you understand that this is a hypothetical situation, and you understand that the homozygous dominant uh, frequency for the genotype is represented by pq. Okay. So P squared, again, is our capital A, capital A frequency. 2PQ is going to refer to our heterozygotes. I always remember that as like, well, here's the home or the, here's the dominant allele, here is the recessive allele frequency, right? The reason we do two is because if you look at a Punnett square for just a heterozygote crossed with a heterozygote right, we have a squared, so that's representing p squared right here. We have little a, little a, that's our q squared, okay, and then we have our heterozygotes, and there are twice as many heterozygote opportunities as there are homozygote opportunities, like each individual homozygote opportunities. So that's where the two come fr comes from. In reality, we will actually derive this equation a little bit in class, but it's just an easy way to remember, okay? So just do a simple home heterozygous cross, uh, and you can remember, like, oh, yeah, there's the 2PQ. Okay? And the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation is provided to you uh, on your AP Biology formula sheet. So it's not a thing that you need to freak out about and memorize. You just know, need to know how to use it. So what we have here is we have allele frequencies for a population. So up top, I have provided to you a population allele frequency for this dominant allele and for this recessive allele. Okay? So I say they're dominant and recessive because they're labeled as P and Q. But as we actually look at this situation, we're going to find that it's not actually a dominant and recessive allele situation. It's actually going to be incomplete dominance, okay? So there's going to be blending, all right? So if I give you the situation in which the P, the allele frequency for the R allele, is 80%. So 80%, if I were to take the gene pool, right, if I were to take all of the alleles, put them in one giant pool, and I just like counted them all up, I would find that 80% of those alleles are this CR. Okay? Remember the C just refers to what chromosome it's on, and then the R is the actual allele itself. Okay? The other 20% is CW, okay? and that codes for white. So R is for red, W is for white. Okay? So there's 20% white alleles and 80% red alleles. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to cross those values, okay? And this looks an awful lot like a Punnett square, and that's because it effectively is, right? But remember that a Punnett square is just our way of demonstrating statistical probability. So we're really just showing statistical probability here, okay? So basically we're going to cross sperm with egg if these are in fact the correct allele frequencies, 80% of our sperm should be the red allele, should contain the red allele, and 20% should contain the white allele. And our egg should be the same way. 80% should contain the red, and 20% should contain the white. So if we try to figure out the chances of the different offspring, what we need to do is we need to figure out, like, okay, if 0.8 or 80% of the time we get this red allele in the sperm, and 80% of the time we get this red allele in the eggs, how often are we going to get a homozygote for that red allele? And that's going to be 64% of the time, because this 80% thing had to happen, and remember in statistics, and means that you're going to multiply your probabilities. So I'm multiplying 
times the other probability, which is 0.8, right? So 0.8 times 0.8 gives me 0.64 or 64%. So 64% of my offspring should be red and should be homozygous for that red allele. Okay, and that's my p squared value. It's p squared because I had to multiply this probability times this probability, 0.8 times 0.8, okay? I can do the same thing for white. I can say, okay, if 20% of my sperm should have white and 20% of my egg should have the white allele, then that's one fifth right, or 20%, this is one-fifth, or 20%, and so if this one-fifth and that one-fifth has to happen in order to get this child right here, then I have to multiply those probabilities, right, because it's and, I have to get a white allele from the sperm and a white allele from the egg, then I'm going to get 1 over 25, also known as 4%, okay, and so that's why it's Q squared, because I took the opportunity for one, you know, the allele frequency for that one allele, and I had to multiply it by itself because it had to happen to make that homozygote, okay? Finally, that takes us to the heterozygotes, okay? So these are the heterozygotes. So there's two ways I can make a heterozygote, and that's why we have that two in front of the 2PQ, okay? There are two ways I'm happy getting a heterozygote, right? I can either get a white allele from the sperm, and a red allele from the egg, so that's being represented by this box right here, okay? Or the exact opposite can happen. If the sperm contains the red allele and the white contains the, or excuse me, the eggs contain the white allele, then this is the probability of that occurring. And so we just have to take those two probabilities and add them together because I'm happy with this box, this probability, or, I'm happy with this one. Remember, in statistics, or means that you add them, right? So I'm happy with either this happening, PQ, right? Because I have a 0.8 chance of the egg containing the red allele and a 0.2 chance of the sperm containing the white allele, okay? I'm happy with that, right? That would give me this person right here, this individual right here. So the chances of that occurring, 0.16, okay? But I'm also happy with this option. So I need to figure out the probability of this option. I need to figure out how likely it is that the egg will contain the white allele. Well, that's 0.2, right? That's right here, it's 20%. And how likely is it that the sperm will contain the red allele? Well, that's 0.8. And you will notice that you're gonna get the same value. So I'm happy with either this top thing happening or this bottom thing happening. Remember, in statistics, or means you add them. I'm happy with this one or with this one. So if I'm trying to figure out the overall probability, I add them together. Okay. So I'm going to add these, and I'm going to get 0.32. Right? If only there was a quicker way to do this than figuring out this proportion, you know, this probability and this probability and adding them together. Well, there is. That's why we have this 2PQ. Because if P and Q are being multiplied both times, which they are being, you're going to get the same value. So instead of doing it twice, just multiply it times 2. Right? That's easier than doing it twice and then adding it to itself. Okay? So that 2PQ is kind of our shortcut. So that's where it comes from here. Okay? I know that's a lot of information and we're going to practice with it. But now that we have information on the allele frequencies and we've taken those allele frequencies, the P's and Q's, and we have plugged them into the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation, the P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1, we can now look at the genotype frequencies. Okay? So I would expect 64% of my offspring to have this genotype of CRCR. Okay? I would expect 4% to have CWCW, and I would expect 32% to have CRCW. Okay? That's what we just figured out doing all those crosses. Okay? Basically, we figured out what the next generation's genotype should look like. If nothing else is happening, if like red doesn't have an advantage over white or pink or anything, then this is what it should look like. If it's just random, 
That's what it should look like, right? So anytime you're given these problems, here are some strategies that will help you tackle them because it can be really daunting, especially if, you know, even simple math, but like applied mathematics is scary to some people, right? So if you are given the genotypes, so if I give you the genotypes, so the combinations of alleles, so capital A, capital A, capital A, little a, and little a, little a, you can calculate P and Q by figuring out the total number of the alleles, okay? And we're going to practice with that. If you know the phenotypes, so if I give you information on the phenotypes, you can use the homozygous recessive genotype as like your go-to, okay? Because basically the homozygous recessive phenotype is only going to show up in homozygous recessive genotypes. So we can figure out Q very easily, and we're going to practice this. I don't expect you to be able to do it yet without any direction. But once we find Q, we can find P. Okay? And then all we have to do is plug in P and Q to figure out whether the population is evolving. So we plug it into this P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared, and if it is in equilibrium, so if the population is not evolving, okay, so if it's in equilibrium and thus it is not evolving, that value should equal 1. Okay, and that's what we saw in this previous situation. If I added together 64% plus 32% plus 4%, that gives you a value of 1. Okay, If that does not occur, then that means the population is evolving. That means that maybe somebody has an advantage over another. Maybe there's non-random mating. It could be a lot of things. Okay, So a couple of practice problems. The scarlet tiger moth has the following genotypes. So I am providing you with genotypes. Calculate the allele and genotype frequencies as a percent for a population of 1612 mods. Okay, so I have given you the population size. Okay, you also could have gotten that by just adding up all these values, right? Because <coughs> these are the genotypes. So 1469 individuals are homozygous dominant. 138 individuals are heterozygous, and five individuals are homozygous recessive, right? So I have given you the genotypes. And so if we look back at our tips, if you are given the genotypes, we can calculate P and Q by adding up the total number of the capital A and the little a alleles, okay? So what I can do is I can figure out how many little a alleles there are, okay? So let's do that now. All right, so if there are 1,612 mods and mods are diploid, how many alleles should I have total? Okay, think about that for a second. If there are 1,612 mods and they're all diploid, so that means they have two copies of every chromosome, how many alleles should I have? Well, if there are 1,612 and every individual has two alleles, I should have double this, right? I should have 32, 24 alleles, okay? That's like my total number of alleles, and that's going to become really, really important if we're trying to calculate the allele frequency, because in order to find a frequency or a percentage, we have to know how big our pie is, right? We can't just figure out how many uh, or excuse me, what percentage something is if we don't know how big it is. So there should be 3,224 alleles total. So let's figure out how many little alleles there are, okay? So the, the recessive allele. So if I look here, I see that there are five individuals who are homozygous recessive. So five individuals have two copies of that recessive allele. So if they have two copies, then it's just five times two. I just take this number, I multiply it by two because there's one there and there's one there. So every individual who is this genotype has one, two copies of that allele. And thus there are five people with that. So there are 10 alleles in that group, 10 little a's. Okay, great. But we also have heterozygotes. So heterozygotes also have a little allele, but they have only one. So what I have to do now is take that 10 and I have to add it to the number of little a's that all of these individuals have. So how many little a's 
are the heterozygotes going to have each? Every heterozygote should have one little a, right? Because their genotype is right here, big A, little a. If there are 138 heterozygotes, they have 138 little a's. So I have 138. Each of them has one. So I get 138. So how many little a's do I have? 148. In that entire population, I have 148 little a's. Okay. So in order to find the frequency for that allele, I just have to go 148 divided by the total number of alleles. The total number of alleles was 3224. Okay. And so if I need to figure out this as a percentage, right, all I have to do is I need to calculate 148 divided by 3224, and I get, and I'm going to keep it as a decimal here because P is more useful as a decimal, P and Q. Uh, I'm going to get zero, or excuse me, 0.045. Okay. I'll just round to 0 0.046 because it's 0.0459. Okay, so 0.046. All right. So that is my allele frequency for the little one, which, if you will recall, is my Q. So I just found Q. Okay. What I can do is I can find P now. So I can now go P plus Q equals 1, and I can calculate P. But we could also, if we look back here, just figure out the number of A alleles. And that's going to be actually a little bit easier okay, for, for an intro practice one. Okay. So now I'm just going to do the same thing for the dominant allele because I want you to be able to do it. So if I have 1,469 individuals who are homozygous dominant, so how many copies of the capital A do they have each? Well, if they're homozygous, they have two. Right? So 1,469 times two is 2,938. Okay. So that's how many capital A alleles there are from this group. But the heterozygotes also have some capital A's. So there are 138 heterozygotes. Each of them has one dominant allele. So 138 times 1 is 138. So now I have to take that 138, add it to the number of the capital A alleles from before. So I have 2938 plus... 138, and I'm going to get 3076. So 3076, that's how many capital A's I have. And the total number of alleles I have is still 3224. Okay. So if I wanted to find the allele frequency for capital A, I just have to do that simple equation. 3076 divided by 3224, and I should get point oh, excuse me, 0 0.954. Okay. And so you will notice that this value plus this value, so 0 0.954 plus 0 0.046, does indeed equal 1, so P plus Q does indeed equal 1. Okay. So now that we have that, we just have to take our P and square it to figure out the genotype frequency for capital A, capital A. So I just have to take my P, so 0 0.954, square it, so multiply it times 0.954, so this is my P squared, and I'm going to get 0.91, roughly. Okay, And then I can do the same thing with Q. So if I square Q, I'm going to get my genotype frequency for little a, little a. So if I go 0 0.046 times 0 0.046, I'm going to get 0 0.002, and I'm rounding, of course. Right? And then if I want to find the genotype frequency for heterozygotes, it's just going to be our value of 2PQ. So 2 times our P is 0 
and our Q is 0.046, and that's going to give me a value of 0.088 roughly, right? And so I'm rounding here, and so it's always careful, or you always should be careful about rounding um, because you'd never want to round to the wrong number of significant figures, right? So like this was actually a 0.910, okay? So if I took 0.910 and 0.088 and 0.002 and I added them, right? Zero, bring up that, zero, bring up that. Bam, and here's my decimal point. You will see that p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. Okay. p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. So in this case, p plus q equals 1, and p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And thus, our population is at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. All right, so I want to, again, recap just some of the things that have to be in place in order for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to be uh, accurate in describing a population. There can be no mutations, no random, or it has to have random mating, excuse me, so no non-random mating. No natural selection can be at work. The population size must be very large, and there can be no gene flow. If any of those doesn't apply, then the population is evolving. Okay, so just reminders of what causes evolution. So mutations, right? Any kind of change in allele frequencies is going to count as evolution here. Non-random mating would be minor causes. So if you know individuals preferred red flowers, well then that's going to affect whether the white flowers get to mate. Okay, so that's going to affect your genotypes, but it won't affect your allele frequencies, and you don't need to worry too too much about that. But basically, it'll affect your uh, Q squared, your P squared, your two PQs, but it won't affect your Q and P themselves. Okay, so it'll affect the ratios of the genotypes, but not the alleles themselves, uh, allele frequencies themselves. And then our major causes of evolution are, of course, natural selection. That's a big one. Genetic drift, which is just randomness in a population. We'll get to that in a second. And gene flow. Okay. So <clears throat> delving into those major causes a little bit. Natural selection is, of course, when individuals who have certain adaptations are better suited to the environment. They're going to be more like likely to survive and reproduce. Genetic drift is basically going to affect small populations the most. And that's why we have that little caveat about having a really large population size. So genetic drift is basically just natural fluctuations in allele frequencies from one generation to another as a result of random chance because genetic drift is basically just random chance there are random chance events in populations right there's two major examples that you need to be familiar with there's the founder effect and the bottleneck effect okay? so genetic drift is a non-selective process so nothing is like choosing one group over another because they're better or anything like that. It's completely random. Okay? And it mainly will occur in small populations because in larger populations, it kind of gets mitigated, right? Like the randomness kind of gets lost in the jumble. Okay? And so basically, random factors are going to affect your allele frequencies. So this could be a lot of different random factors. Um, we're going to talk about a few, but it could just be random passing on of alleles. So like maybe... In a small population, one generation, all the kids born are males, right? Like that's going to matter a lot to the population, right? And works the same way. That'll be less likely to happen if you have more individuals and thus more mating pairs, okay? Also, some members of a population might produce more offspring than others, and that is going to be mitigated by a larger population size as well. So we need to start thinking about those two different groups, right, of uh, random chance, genetic drift, founder effect, and bottleneck effect. So I want to show you the founder effect in action, okay? And so if we take a an original population, so that's what I have on the left here. So this population is fairly diverse, okay? And we have allele frequencies of red and green. That's what's being represented here. This is the gene pool, 
of the population. So these are the alleles themselves. Okay? Then a small group of individuals goes off to the side and they are going to go into a new area. They are going to found a new population. Okay? So as they get together in this small group, randomness is going to be more likely to affect them because there's fewer individuals. And so maybe some kind of a random effect causes there to be more of these pink alleles in the next generation. And then eventually it's all pink in that group. Okay. And so if it ends up being all pink, then these guys will go on to establish a new population. And when they do that, they're all going to be the same. They're all going to be pink because that's the only allele left. There's no green left. Okay. And so it's just important to know that this will affect small populations more than it'll affect large populations. This is more vulnerable to a decrease in variation as a result of random chance than this was. It's pretty unlikely that all of the green in this left group are going to disappear. But if we take a small group of them, it's going to become more likely. Okay. okay, and so we also have this effect known as the bottleneck effect, okay. and this is another example of genetic drift occurring. So if you change a population size drastically, usually it's going to be due to a change in the environment, the group that's left might no longer really represent the original population's gene pool. So like if I had a big population, right, that's what I have here on the y-axis, I have population size. So I had a nice big population here. But then some kind of a catastrophic, catastrophic event occurred, maybe a drought, maybe a volcanic eruption. It could be a bunch of stuff, right? Something happened right here, and that caused my population to totally decimate down. Okay, That small group that's left might no longer represent the diversity that was in the original population. Okay, So in my uh, little diagram here, it's called the bottleneck effect because of this idea, this visual here. But if I had a nice big population and then something occurred that caused most individuals to not make it, well, the only individuals that were able to make it through in this case were green. So yeah, the original population had green and blue, but that's no longer going to be represented by what's left over. And so when these guys go on to you know, try to form a new population or try to uh, reestablish their old population, they're not really going to resemble the original group very well, right? And so all of these things cause a reduction in genetic variation, and that's going to be that's going to cause differences between populations, and that's going to become really important as we start talking about speciation. Okay, genetic drift is really important, but it's also really confusing because it's randomness, right? And so a lot of different things can happen. Here's two videos I would recommend you check out for genetic drift specifically. But genetic drift will affect populations just like the ones we saw before. So here we have the same idea of the frequency of the R allele with the frequency of the W allele, the red and white respectively, right? In generation one, we have this group right here. We can see their genotypic frequency and thus their phenotypic frequency. And then if five plants have the offspring, right, we have changed our allele frequency. So this was a small population. Maybe some individuals got to mate and others didn't, right, for some reason. So now, you know, it could be a random reason. Maybe the pollen just didn't get where it wanted to go, right? Uh, here, my allele frequencies have changed, okay? And then now we're only going to have two plants having offspring. Maybe it's the red and the red, Right? That's why they're boxed like that. And now, by generation three, literally all of our plants are red, meaning that our p-value is 100%. That's the only allele left. Right, So if it's a small population like this one, it has monumentous effects on the population in just a matter of generations. Okay? And so that's really important when we start talking about like conservation, because when conservation is involved, that means the population is really small and we're worried about it. Well, if it's small, that means that we're more they're more susceptible to these kind of effects. Okay? And then finally, our last major cause of evolution is gene flow. So that is movement of fertile individuals between populations. So it's one person flowing into another population. Okay? And so that's going to cause a population to gain or lose alleles because maybe the person who left had the only red alleles left, right? And so now they're bringing it to another population, but now we don't have any more red alleles.
right? And basically that causes this like blending between populations. If you're allowing individuals to go from population one to population two, and they're like mating back and forth, population one and two are going to continue resembling each other a lot. But if you separate them, you keep them separate, they might differentiate more. Okay. And so I want to take us back to the term fitness, right? And so this is basically your ability to survive and reproduce. And natural selection is going to affect the frequency of populations in three different ways. So it can be a directional selection. So it might cause a frequency to go in one direction, either more common or less common. So left or right. Uh, so that's what's happening down here. I have my original population on this dashed line. It's a normal curve, right? Here's my average value. Okay? And then if there's some selection against an extreme, so like if for some reason being on this left side is super, super bad, well, over time, that means I'm going to move to the right as a population, right? These guys are going to die off and we're going to have larger beaks or whatever it is that we're testing here. Right. We also can have disruptive selection. Okay. So disruptive selection is when we have basically it forms a bimodal curve. So like we had a normal curve, right? That's what we had here. And then something happened that caused it to be kind of bad to be in the middle. So like this is our mean. For some reason, being in the middle is bad. You either want to be on the left or you want to be on the right. And so in disruptive selection, we're going to disrupt that normal curve and we're going to form this like two humped looking thing. Okay. And then finally we have stabilizing selection, which is basically the exact opposite. So in stabilizing selection, being average is awesome. Whatever this value is, it could be like beak size, it could be whatever. Being average is great. So they're going to survive more. But being anywhere away from average, like off to the sides, is really bad. And so those individuals are going to die. And then over time, more and more individuals are going to be near that middle, that average. And so we're going to mostly be, you know, a really, really narrow normal curve. And we're going to practice with that. I don't want you to freak out too much, but this is kind of what it would look like in reality. So like if we have a phenotype of fur color along the x-axis, so we have white on the left and darker colors on the right, frequency of individuals or percentage of individuals that have that phenotype is on the y-axis. In black, or excuse me, in red, the solid red line, we have our original population this time, so it's kind of flip-flop from what we saw a slide ago, right? If it's directional selection, maybe it's good to be darker colored, maybe because the environment changed, and so we're going to notice over time that populations become darker. If it's disruptive selection, maybe being brown isn't so good, but being white or black is good. And so over time, we're going to see that the amount of brown individuals goes down, but the individuals with white or black fur will go up. Okay. And then stabilizing selection is the exact opposite. Maybe it's bad to be black or white, but it's good to be brown. Over time, we're going to see that pretty much only brown is left. Okay. These are all kind of hypothetical situations, but I've got some examples down here that could exist in reality and have existed in reality. Okay, so basically with stabilizing selection and, and uh, disruptive selection, you're going to notice that the average didn't really change. So like even for this new line, the average is right here, even though like almost no one's at that average, it's still there. Same here, we have the, the average just being the same as it was before, right? But with directional selection, I've actually moved the average. Remember, the average is just at the middle of our curve. Okay. And I just want to briefly mention sexual selection. I'm hoping to do a full lecture on it, but it's just one type of natural selection, and basically it focuses on mating. So it focuses on why a trait might help you to mate better than another trait. Okay. Um, and so often it'll be bad for survival, but really good for reproduction. Like we think of peacocks, right? So peacocks have these beautiful, gigantic feathers, and they're great to look at, and females will prefer a male with more vibrant colors like that, but it's really impractical. And those individuals will often die because they can't fly away properly or they stand out too much in their environment. Okay? And so even though it's bad for survival, females still prefer it. Okay? And so I just want to introduce this term sexual dimorphism, which is differences between two sexes, right? So there's sexual dimorphism in humans as well. Females look different from males in lots of different ways, right? And so animals are the same way. 
And there is intrasexual and intersexual selection. So there's intrasexual, so that's selection within the same sex. So males competing with other males. Maybe having bigger teeth is good to compete with another male. Whereas intersexual is all about that choice that I was talking about. So females may prefer smaller teeth. And so there's going to be a balance between like, okay, well, bigger teeth help me win, but smaller teeth are preferred. So I don't know where it's going to end up, right? We're going to see that change over time. And so I don't want you to get too bogged down in that because like I said, I really want to do an entire lecture on sexual selection. Um, but because this lecture has gone on so long, I'm going to go ahead and end this here. Uh, and that'll basically do it for chapter 23. It's really going to come down to practicing Hardy Weinberg and practicing uh, understanding populations and how they change over time rather than just individuals. So with that, I'm going to end chapter 23.